I overpaid for a ruined piece of Gibson history. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Starting off our journey today, we need to talk about the powerhouse budget guitars of the late 70s. We're talking about the ultimate mid-tier walnut tag team known as the Paul and the SG. Budget-level solid-body electric guitars have been within Gibson's catalog since the 50s, starting with the Juniors and the Specials and the Melody Makers, and they evolved throughout the years and took on many different body shapes. However, under Norlin ownership, we saw the introduction of the Bolt-On Neck series, Things like the Marauder, the S1, the Midnight Special, later transforming into things like the Sonics, the Challenger, and the Corvus models. And all of these models that I've just named have their own pros and cons. But in 1978, Gibson introduced the Paul, and it just completely changed the game. It looks similar to a regular Les Paul, except for we didn't have the maple top, it had some extra comfort carves on it, it was made out of walnut. It's essentially the coffee table burst, but these things are fantastic guitars. So many people grew up with these, and they are now cult classics. But in 1979, Gibson followed it up with a VSG. And then a year later, we have a solid body 335 get introduced known as the 335S. And that's also when the branding starts to change to fire brand on these. So as far as the Gibson lineup goes in the 70s and early 80s, these weren't bottom of the barrel. They were perfect mid-tier guitars. And today I have one of the prototypes. So let's go ahead and get this thing unboxed, even if it was ruined. Brace yourselves, this will be a slightly iconic episode, at least for me, because I love those models, and to have a prototype in my collection makes me very happy. This is the VSG prototype, and we're going to get to document it here with our good friends Garfield and Odie. But yeah, sadly, it was ruined. A, some bonehead put a Kaler on it, and no, it's not factory stock. But well, that's okay, a prototype is a prototype. And what makes this one extra special is it was Kalamazoo built and it dates to 1978. And as we had just learned, the SG didn't come out till 79. But the SGs in general are pretty interesting guitars. I was always kind of confused where they really fit into the lineup as far as the vintage market goes a couple of years because a regular SG standard costs like only a couple hundred bucks more. You might as well just get the full on standard, right? No, these things have their own charm being made out of walnut wood. But the biggest difference between these and an SG standard of the era comes down to your neck profile. This has your traditional wide nut width. Whereas the SG standards of the era, they're a little bit smaller. I mean, maybe not as small as the early, early 70s. But that's the true reason why you pick a VSG over an SG standard if the looks aren't necessarily appealing to you. But most of these did indeed come stock with a double black T-top pickup and then you got the zebra bobbin. And I always love the fact that these things had a natural headstock rather than a black veneer over top. But my other favorite thing about the series guitars is the fact that they came stock with ebony fretboards. That might not have been special at the time that this was produced, but nowadays on the used market, it's like you can almost get Les Paul custom specs or an SG custom like specs without breaking the bank too much because the electronics, they were completely the same as say a standard or a custom of the era. And if you're curious how much these things were brand new, look at this cool poster. It says an SG for half a G. So they were about $500 at list price. But something that is interesting about this prototype is the fact that we actually have a mini toggle switch on here. Kinda looks similar to the style that Gibson was using at this time, and the fact that it does look like we have the original pickups, we're gonna have to see if that was a planned factory type thing that these were going to have. And if you're sad that this isn't a The Paul prototype, I actually have seen it. It was a long time ago, around 2019 or 2020. It was either on my Facebook page or somebody emailed me. They were buying a The Paul, and when they opened up the back side of the control cavity, it read prototype inside and it had like certain signatures. If that was you, please email me those again because I've never been able to find those photos. They got lost. But a prototype like this is a lot of fun, but I, I've got more questions than answers right now. So let's go ahead and get this thing on the workbench so we can see what's going on with it. All right, time to learn the secrets of the VSG. All right, so first things first, our neck pickup is upside down. And at first I thought, okay, that's gonna be easy enough to flip around because traditionally you have your pole pieces in the bridge position like this and the neck, the adjustable one should be up here. But when I flipped this around, I quickly understood why it was installed like this. The lead is not long enough anymore to flip the pickup around, but you can see it looks like it dates to 1978, April something. Unfortunately, it's a little bit faded, but you can tell that there's never been pickup covers on these, which is how all the SGs shipped. That's kind of the unique thing about these guys is they have that zebra bobbin. I 
wonder if it has anything to do with Neil Sean doing that with his modifications, but I mean, that would have been like right on the tail end of when he started doing that as far as I understand it. But here's the backside of our bridge pickup. You can tell it had something on it at one point in time, but it's faded. But this is the original set of T-tops. They get the name because they have T's on the bobbins. But here's what the cavities look like. Unfortunately, no fancy writings saying who worked on the guitar or anything like that. It's just very bare bones. You can just see the router pin marks. As far as pickup ratings, the bridge is 7.7k ohms, our neck position is 7.56, and our middle just for fun, 3.82, so that is reading exactly the way I would like to see. Overall, she cleaned up okay. I didn't want to use any like super buffing compound to make it look really good because it's a satin finish. The more you polish it, the more glossy it's going to get. Yeah, it's already pretty glossy, but you could definitely make it uneven. But this thing had definitely seen so many smoky bar gigs. There's so much tar all over this thing. I cleaned it six or seven times and I still get this tar substance coming off of it. That's why when I say just because your natural finish has aged from this to that, sometimes that's just a tar layer over over top and you can clean some of it off but the other part is the finish is just age looking under the pick guard it shows you what the original finish would have looked like but i love these walnut bodies when they've evenly aged like this it just gives them a whole new vibe it's nice and dark but it's always important to check underneath your sg pick guards because people do weird stuff under sgs all the time like adding coil split switches extra knobs so if you're ever buying a vintage sg take that pick guard off you might not think anything's hiding under there but a lot of times there are hidden routes and somebody's replaced your pick guard so you would never know but this is a nice five ply pick guard that we have on this one the finish has been completely worn in this area likely because of his strumming or maybe that's how he anchored his hand i'm not sure but hey check out these ambered over knobs those are looking good nice and original it's two volumes and two tones with a three-way toggle switch. And yes, I can confirm that this is not original. It's not even hooked up right now. So that means there were different pickups in here at one point in time, but we'll take a look at that more on the back. Now to the meat and potatoes of the episode. Does this look factory done to you guys? No. And that's what was unfortunate. When this thing first popped up and somebody pitched it to me for sale, they thought the Kaler was original, so I had them tear it apart. But when it turned out this thing had been heavily modified, I'm happy, even though it's ruined. I have no intentions of ever selling this. But what it looks like to me is some of the SGs came with harmonica bridges, other ones did have the Nashville style. So I can't tell you what this originally shipped with, but then somebody put the Kaler in here and they swapped out our studs to these brass ones. Now what's unique about this one is this post won't actually come out. It's like completely seized. And the part that sits in the body honestly isn't really that flush. It needs to be tightened up a little bit. But inside here, you can't see the ground wire. But this was definitely amateurly hacked out because normally these are nice and squared off if they were from the factory, but this actually has like a slope to it. I've seen worse Kaler installations though. But since that's at such an angle, filling this in with another block of walnut would be very tricky because I'm conflicted. Ideally, I would like to have this back to how it left the factory originally. Have that filled in, take care of our locking nut, but you're always going to see this ugly block. I mean, even if you have the most perfectly matching stuff, you would still have to reroute this out for a regular Kaler route and then block it. Then you'd have to try to match the aged finish and that's never gonna work. My other option is I could run it like this. That's right, if somebody's giving you a great deal on a Kaler equipped guitar and you don't quite care for it, if it's the 80s version, you could put a regular stop bar tailpiece and bridge back on it. It uses all the same stuff. You'll just have a big gaping hole under it. In fact, check out this Les Paul Artisan review where I had set it up like that, but I got a piece of wood floor planking and just <laughs> put it over top. It didn't look the best, but it was fun. So knowing that it will never look right no matter what I do, for today, I'm just going to leave the Kaler on it. However, in the future, I think it would be really cool to throw a block of ebony in there and have it inlaid with Mother of Pearl just like an ebony block SG. So then we're not really trying to hide the Kaler route, we're just celebrating its history, but restoring it back to regular configuration and having something that tells that tale a little bit better than a bad touch-up job. Another thing that I would tell you that this is not factory stock is branded Kaler. Gibson did ship factory stock Kaler guitars, but they typically read Gibson. Well, here's what the back of one of these monstrosities look like. Modern day Kalers, they're actually really not that bad, but these vintage ones, uh, a lot of guys just don't like them. I don't like them because they ruin so many guitars. <laughs> 
Looking at our end grain, it is a two-piece walnut body, but most DSGs actually have more than two pieces. They were inexpensive for a reason, right? But moving on from there, we have an ebony fretboard. It would not surprise me had this guitar been refretted, because we do have typical refret signs, like a small chip out of our ebony fretboard right there. And looking along the edges, it doesn't look like the frets go all the way into the gaps. That's not always necessarily a sign, but it's always hard to tell a refret if somebody uses the same style fret wire and the guitar didn't originally have binding. So it is a possibility because this thing was played a lot and it's still got fret wear, don't get me wrong. It could be the original set, but the frets do look just a little bit nicer than the rest of the guitar. You'll see that on the back of the neck. The finish has been pretty well worn through, but you got this nice, beautiful streaky ebony here. And you've got a minor crack in the fretboard right here, but that's nothing to worry about. And I like this, even though it's technically a budget guitar, it has real mother of pearl dot inlays. You don't get that nowadays. That's still a 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length. And it feels like closer to a 10 inch fretboard radius, but I'm sure most of these left the factory as 12. But now the true reason why you buy one of these, it's about a 1.7 inch nut width, 2.05 by the 12th. First fret neck depth of 0.82 and 0.98 by the 12th. It's a nice rounded C shape. Here's that neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. It's pretty much a C shape, but gets a little bit flatter towards the 12th. And it also looks like at one point in time, somebody has shimmed the original nut. That's a little bit more obvious on the treble side. Although the action on this guitar is not very good at all now that I have strings on it. I mean, the neck is perfectly straight, so it's not a neck issue. I've taken the saddles down about as far as you can go before you get weird buzzing. So maybe that's just part of the Kaler wasn't 100% properly installed. But now let's move on to the headstock. Man, it breaks my heart. The original VSG truss rod cover has been cut for a locking nut. I mean, that's one of the first ones. Generally, there are more than one prototype, not always, but one of the first ones made, chopped. If only they would have left the other portion in the case or something, but that's the original hole right there to secure it. And then what I'm thankful for, if I ever did want to restore this, they didn't actually fully install the locking nut. They just used these two screws right there. That's what those are. But you're also supposed to have two small ones right there. They're just really hard to get to. But this style of locking nut tells me exactly when this was installed. It was the late 80s. Because this is the style of lock nut that Gibson used around 1988. Check out the SG Elite video that I just recently did. And you can see the exact same style there. So basically the way these things work is you lift up here. Then you have this bit that secures to the underside of here, and that kind of pinches the string to lock it into place. These locking nuts are a little bit trickier than a Floyd Rose style because they have so many little parts. If you end up losing one of these little washers, they don't work as well. They're also sloped, so if you ever take one apart and you can't get it back together, make sure you have the big slope on this end and the smaller slope there. Otherwise, these locking caps don't actually go back into place. They'll get stuck right here, and if you try to force it down, you might break it. And if you completely loosen them and you wonder why it won't tighten, it's because you've lost this bottom part so you have to take the whole thing off to realign them and make sure the screws line up but as i told you earlier these are really difficult to get off because to access it you have to loosen this little screw right here which takes off all your caps and then you'll be able to access that so these things are just a real pain in the butt honestly but this lock nut yeah i couldn't even get it to lock the strings again so i must be doing something wrong on that aspect but anyways at least our truss rod's still in good shape on this thing and we've miraculously got our original tuners on here and we still have the Gibson decal. Now let's have some fun on the back. We can see our beautiful walnut wood grain. It's definitely got some play wear, but surprisingly, not too much finish missing or a whole bunch of belt buckle rash or anything like that. As much as it was played, it was relatively unscathed, but I love this. I love it when prototypes are different from the production runs. Look at that. So the later production versions, they just decided to pretty much route all this out. Whereas this looks just like a Les Paul's route on the backside. They left more wood in this. But this pot code dates to 1979, the fifth week. And I'm sure that would be something similar. This one looks like the third week of 79, as does this one. So I would believe those are the original pots in here, but you can tell some of the soldering work has been touched up. Here's the back side of that toggle switch. You can see it's not connected to anything. So it must have had four conductor pickups in here at one point in time. So it could be like series parallel and or oil splitting. But here's another area where this differs from the production ones. Look at the output jack. If I'm not mistaken, I think the location is actually different. But look at this. 
and I look at a production one, the production one's got like more of a long barrel style and it would actually stick out far into the cavity. Whereas this one, they had to do like some additional routing there, but it does look like your typical style SG one of the era. So that's something they slightly refined later on. So that was cool to see. Looks like we got Schaller strap locks. That would not be original. And just for fun, we can take a look along the edges. Lots of nicks and dings and our other side. But now let's take a look at this neck. I think this might be mahogany. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Because if you look at the walnut right here, there is a slight color difference between the neck and the body. And it's got the same color finish over top of it in that area. That looks more like mahogany wood grain to me, which would kind of make sense on a prototype. But you've got a couple of gashes on the neck. I like this knot in the wood right here. They just let it be because it's, ah, it's just a prototype. We're not selling this thing anyway. But it does indeed appear to be three pieces but the finish is just completely worn off in this area. It wouldn't surprise me if that was actually sanded off by somebody because it looks a little bit more deliberate than playing wear. Usually when it's playing wear, you just see it in patches on the neck unless it was played really heavily. So, I mean, there's really no way to know. Back here, the original Grovers and that beautiful, beautiful Gibson original prototype stamp. Then yes indeed, 1978, 336th day of the year, and it was the 63rd guitar in the production batch for this particular day. This one is under 500, so it doesn't have a Made in USA stamp, that makes it a little bit unique as compared to all the other ones, and this was indeed Kalamazoo made, whereas all the other ones were Nashville. So to me, that makes it worth paying a premium for because Kalamazoo, that's the original build. They do their volutes just slightly different than the Nashville. Typically, it's the more experienced people. Having a Kalamazoo guitar is always a slight premium over the Nashville ones when you get into ultra collector mode anyway. But they're all great guitars. And being a Kalamazoo prototype, I wonder if this thing stuck around until they closed that down in 1985 and that's when it was released into the wild because that's when like this style of Kaler and lock nut starts to come into play. So who knows, maybe somebody enjoyed it as is just with the Kaler on it. But all said and done with the chunky Kaler and arm, it weighs eight pounds, 6.7 ounces. So let's go ahead, plug it in and hear how it sounds. This guitar plays really well with chords because the action's just a, a little bit higher than I would prefer right now. But I love that neck pickup. <laughs> Middle pickup has a great chime to it as well. <laughs> and bridge. You can just tell that's going to be a fire breather with some distortion. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now that we know all about the VSG prototype, my goodness, this thing is a fire breather. No wonder it was played as much as it was. That bridge pickup is just absolutely insane. I mean, the neck pickup is great for cleans as well. This is just a total package. No wonder this prototype made it into production. I just really wish this Kaler and improperly installed lock nut system never would have happened because this would have been the perfect guitar. So it's really exciting and very disheartening all at the same time to add this one to my collection because I know what it could have been and I know what it was and it's a little bit past its prime because of some crazy modifier guy. But hey, I'm very happy I was able to document and share this one with the world. The VSG prototype, maybe not as cool as the Paul, because the Paul is the one that started it all. This one was probably a pretty easy prototype project. It's like, okay, let's take the Paul specs and throw it onto an SG. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Share this video to a friend who you think would enjoy it. And we will catch you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.